Cobalt Classic Amiga. Cobalt IP Analog. Cobalt IP Digital. What can they actually do and are they any good at it? Hi, welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. And in this video, I'm looking at Cobalt Slow Action Point Motors. But why do we want these in the first place? Well, Chadwick really is a DCC uh, sound capable layout, and that's what I'm building. And in my very first video on the original Chadwick, which was a kind of a, a small um, exhibition style tail chaser, I'd fitted both SEEP and PICO solenoid point motors. And hopefully you can see in the following extract a couple of locomotives chuntling around, but also the noise of the point motors firing off. And as you might set a route, you know, the thing goes off like sort of machine gun fire, dink, 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 as these things come in. But it ruins the the perception of our little world that we've created. We've got track, we've got ballast, we've got trees, we've got buildings. We make this miniature world and then we add sound to it for another dimension. And then we put in these strange little point motors that go dink all the time. I then came across the world of David Townend and McKinley Railway. And David had always used slow action point motors down there in Bournemouth. So I thought to myself, um, you know, could I incorporate that into a bigger layout once I'd realised that um, the little the small Chadwick layout that I first built wasn't really what I wanted. So to that end, on the layout now, I must have a fast approaching 50 slow action point motors. Now, I've received many comments down in the comment section down below of asking why I'm still using tortoise point motors when there are much better alternatives, let's say, on the market. Well, to be honest, tortoise have served me well and they serve McKinley well. So you kind of stick with what you know. I mean, it's the easy option, isn't it? But then I went along to a show and I was talking to Richard Brighton of DCC Concepts who make cobalt point motors. And Richard's been very kind to me in the past. And um, I've got a, an alpha meter off him, which I reviewed, and it is absolutely brilliant. But, you know, I mentioned about point motors and as quick as a flash, he thrust these three point motors into my grubby little mitts. He said, well, do a review, see what you think. So, full disclosure time. These were free. I can do with them as I please, and I may use them in my layout. I may give them to West Camel Model Railway, whatever. Um, but if you choose to buy a thousand of these, there's nothing in it for me. I'm not being paid to do this, and there is no affiliate link in the Show More tab. So therefore, all you get from me is an honest opinion. So. Let's have a look and see what these three point motors are all about. So here we are with our three different point models and we have the classic Omega, we have the IP analog, IP being intelligent power, and we also have the IP digital. Three uh, almost identical looking point look, looking motors, they are in the same form factor, it's the same shell and they all have a, a similar nine-way spring-loaded connector. They also all have a lifetime guarantee to the initial purchaser. So you buy them second on eBay and you don't have your, your warranty anymore, which is quite understandable really, isn't it? One other thing they all require, at the same with tortoise point motors, is that when you come to fit them to your point, you need to remove, at least with these Pico points, you need to remove the spring from um, from the point, which, which puts fear into the hearts of man. So I shall show you just how easy it is to tear the spring out. Now with a little luck you can see that there is a small spring just inside there and all I do is get a pair of snips and I take hold of the spring, put my thumb over that little panel and grab the spring and pull it out. Easy as that, done and dusted. And we're there. People get worried about doing this. I can't see why. I've never broken one yet. Um, it really isn't any big deal at all. Well, here they are out of their packaging and we've got the classic Omega and the IP analog. Very similar. We've got a set of instructions with both a double-sided sticky pad and a bag of bits. And in the bits there is um, 
five screws, so you only need four, so there's a thoughtful one there for losing one, and an armature wire and the fulcrum itself to make the thing work, which I'll go with that in a, in a moment. But let's talk the, about the differences internally to these two items. Well, these are stall motors, so therefore when they operate and they finish their, their uh, movement of travel, power is still applied. But in the Amiga Classic, it constantly draws 18 milliamps, whereas in the IP Digital, it only draws five. No big shakes, not a lot of power, is it? Until, of course, you have a, a larger layout, let's say, with um, 20 points. Well, if you have 20 points, then doing my maths in public, 20 points will then mean you're going to constantly draw 360 milliamps, whereas with this one, you'd only draw 100 milliamps. I mean, basically, this one is three times less power hungry, as it were, than this one. So it sort of makes sense. In the long term, it's going to cost you less to run on a biggish layout, especially if your layout is running for um, prolonged periods. And the technology in this one is clearly better. A couple of other little differences, and that is this one is um, has a switch on the side and um, it changes the power. So this, this switch is between 6 and 12 volts, or you turn the switch over and it goes to 12 to 18 volts, that's DC. And to change the direction, you just reverse the terminals into 1 and 2 through a double pole, double throw switch. Anyway, with this one, a little bit different, because on this switch here, it's to reverse the action of the point itself, and the power on this one is anywhere between 7 and 23 volts DC, so it seems a more of a sensible option. Of course, this is therefore naturally going to be more expensive, and this one here is £17.95, and this one's £21.95, and I'll just double check. Yeah, that's correct. So what would I do if I was going to buy these? Well, I must confess that £4 saving I would dispense with and go for the newer option because it's that much more um, technologically advanced and I believe more stable, especially on the power consumption front. Right, let's stick a few wires on it and see how it works. Now, if you're a regular on the channel, you'll know that I use um, generally 702 cable to switch my points and I use blue and yellow. Um, not red and black because red and black is my track power feed. Now it says in the um, in the DCC concepts destructions um, to strip back 10 millimeters worth of cable and give them a twist, which I've done. And to fit these into these terminals, then you need to push back on these little spring-loaded uh, plungers and fit your cables. So it's easier to do this with the armature wire not fitted, if that makes sense. So if I push that back down, pop in my little blue cable all the way, let it go, give it a tug, and it's good to go. So I should repeat the same for whoops, my yellow. Push that back, get the yellow, poke it in the hole. Give it a tug. Beautiful. Right. So this is the, this is the power feed to operate the point. Now, I've connected it up, as you can see, to my beautiful old duet. So if I turn it one way, then this will turn. And if I turn it the other way, it should go the other way. Now, to make that a little bit easier to see, I shall temporarily fit the armature wire. So if I pop that in, the armature wire is straightforward, really. Poke that in the little hole. It comes pre-bent, which is quite useful. So I poke that in the hole. Pop this, yeah, it falls straight out again. Let's see if I can hold it in with the, the screw. This is always, I find, a little bit fiddly. So I shall put the screw in first and give it a turn. Then poke the armature wire in. Get in your little darling. And being the caring sort of bloke I am, I put a little white tag on it so you can actually see it operates. Okay. So now, if I apply 12 volts DC to it, it will run in one direction. That's the direction it's always in, already in. And if I put it in the other direction, then the point motor should operate. 
and I can feel the vibration coming through here as the gearing system works and then as the um, as, it, as it sort of de-energizes when it hits it, it, its stop. So I turn it back the other way. Beautiful. Okay, so we can get our point to throw both ways by supplying it with 12 volts DC either one direction or the other through a double pole double throw switch. Easy. But we did speak about switching frogs. Now if you're a user of electro frog points, clearly you need more feeds now because you need track power going in and you need a cable going back out to the frog. Now my cable colours are red and black for track power, normally black to the back, red to the front, and my frog cables are always green, so I shall quickly fit another set of cables. Well, I've now connected up those cables, and hopefully you can see that there's a red, green, and black cable connected into terminals four, five, and six. Now, if I turn these over so you can see the terminal descriptions, hopefully you can see there that terminal six is S2C, and then there's S2R and S2L, i.e. left and right, and C is common. So what does that mean? Well, obviously the common is for the frog, which is my green cable, and my track power is supplied in on the red and black cables. So if I throw the point uh, in either direction, either the black or the red, will be connected to the frog because as the frog as this point changes you want the frog polarity to shift so all being well if i connect um, my black cable onto the frog and we should so if i change the point now hopefully you'll be able to see that you can hear the point changing and suddenly we've got what 13 and a half volts on the frog because we've changed the polarity. Now, if on the back of my little duet, I then go to the other terminal, which is not powered, and I change the point the other way, power should switch back across. And there it does. So that's how it works, which is all straightforward, really, isn't it? Okay, so we have the, the um, yellow and blue cables operating the uh, the point motor mechanism itself and the red, black and green cables sorting out the frog polarity. OK, can it do anything else? Now, as well as having the yellow and blue feeds going into the power of the point, you can also take off a feed from both of those um, through an LED onto your control panel to show you which position the point is in. Now, this is known as a prototyping breadboard. It looks more complicated than it really is. Um, but what, we, what I've simply done is I've connected the yellow cable into, the, into here and I've taken the yellow cable straight back out again into the point motor. And then running across the breadboard in a straight line, I've got a resistor to protect the LEDs and I've got a red and green uh, LEDs and an LED only allows current through in one direction. So they are opposed in a polarity sense. So you've got the positive and the negative on one and the negative and the positive on the other. And then they connect up to the blue cable, which obviously completes the circuit and goes into the point motor. Now, so if I turn the point motor one way or the other, the green light comes on and the point motor operates. And if I turn it in the other direction, the red light comes on as, again, the point motor operates. Now, you may not be able to see that very well, but if I turn all the lights down in here now and do it again, there's the red light on and I throw the point motor, up comes the green, and then throw it back the other way and up comes the red and the point motor changes again. So as you can see, it's quite simple to take a feed off of the supply cables to um, the point motor to a control panel and then you can just build your own circuit there so you can see exactly what position your points are in. Now for my final trick as it were with this little point motor is I've disconnected the um, frog uh, cables from terminals 4, 5 and 6 just for simplicity to keep them out of the way and I brought in power on terminal 7 and I've taken it out on 8 and 9. 
and it won't be rocket science to see the colours here because we now can switch a signal and hopefully here the signal is, yes it is, the signal is red. So if I throw the point, hopefully the signal will go from red to green as the point changes. And back again. So there we go, quite a versatile little point motor for what it is, I must confess. I'm quite impressed with that. A um, little bit of a fiddly, obviously, poking the cables in and things, but once this is installed underneath your layout with the sticky pad to put it in position and then to secure it with the four screws, um, and I wouldn't take out those four screws, I think they would stay in um, forever kind of thing, um, and not rely on the sticky pad to, to keep it where it should be. Um, and then it's easier then to, to uh, put these cables in. It's quite actually quite difficult on the bench poking it in because invariably the armature wire is in the way when I want to turn it upside down and, and poke them in. But, I mean, to switch a, uh, a two aspect signal and the frog and obviously the, the guts of the point motor itself and of course LED indications going back to your control panel, this is a pretty nifty little device. And I'm still smiling because it's got a lifetime guarantee. And I think to myself, you know, these things don't necessarily last forever. But as long as you've got the receipt, you can get yourself a new one. Right, onward. Let's go to DCC. So here we are now in the world of digital. And here is the Cobalt IP Digital. And it is exactly the same form factor as the others. The difference is... Um, that are apparent are there's first thing is that there's a switch on the side here which is used for digital programming now there's no point in me showing you how to program an address because everyone in the world is going to have a different system and i use digitrax and you probably use power cab or um, a dynamis or whatever so there's a switch on the side it's the two position switch it's set or run and obviously when you set your address you can write the address and then once it's in and done and tested put it back sorry once it's in and done put it back to run, test it, make sure it's all good to go, and away you go. Now, the nine terminals on the other one um, differ, differ here, because terminal three is your frog wire, whereas on the other ones, it was terminal four, five, and six, I think, for your frog wire, um, because your track feed was different than your power feed. Well, being a, a, digit, a DCC feed, it's one and the same. So your frog cable will come out of terminal three. Terminals 4, 5 and 6 are um, the same as 7, 8 and 9 on the IP analogue. You can use those to uh, a, a, a two aspect switch, something like that. The real difference comes with uh, switches 7, 8 and 9 because they are PBS, L, R and C. PBS, push button switches. And it's how you wish to uh, change the position of your switch without using a DCC command. So you can always chunter away on your model railway, stabbing the buttons on your controller and changing it, or you might want to use a standard control panel. So how would you do that? Now I've found two options really. They are a single pole double throw switch with a center off. So it obviously returns to the middle position, but pulses the uh, signal either way, or there's a push button arrangement so you can push it for one direction or push it for the other. So let's connect these up and see how it performs. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do first. I'm just going to remove the armature wire again because it makes it so much more difficult. to pop these in. Right, so hopefully you can see now. So we'll pop the black in, which goes in terminal eight, and the others go into terminal, the reds go into nine and seven. Okay, so here we are then with, the di with my Dynamis up and running and if I just press the
you can see the motor running. Now, if I press one of these buttons, nope, go for the other one. And if I press the same button again, nothing will happen because it's the other one that must needs to command it. So quite a simple arrangement. And if you wanted those on your um, control panel for your switch, you would just put one, you know, the, obviously the signal would, the um, point would change upwards or whatever, or downwards for the other one. Nice and straightforward, easy answer. But if that doesn't uh, float your boat, then we can easily pull those. And if I just put the other one in, This is so much easier without that uh, armature wire in place, but I will just pop it back in now so you can see how it looks with it. Pop that in. I need the screw. Mm-hmm. Easy tiger. Pop the fulcrum back in. And now hopefully when we operate this little switch, so we're pulsing it one way, wrong way. And then we pulse it in the other direction and it goes back. And it really is that straightforward. Now, of course, the whole concept of DCC operations is one of flexibility and added value for money, really. Um, and this point motor really doesn't have enough terminals in it to really bring its full potential out. So to that end, DCC concepts have brought out this thing here, which is a REX, which um, is a small component containing four relays, which allows you to control other things, more signals, um, a little bit of, um, of automation. But that, perhaps that's a, um, an item for another video at a later date, but I'm not really going to get stuck into that. One thing it is worth mentioning, though, is um, in case you can't get your uh, point motors in the right place because of under the you know, frames and timbers underneath they do make a 90 degree adapter so you can surface mount this or put this underneath the boards so that you can move your point motor away from the point but still control it with that it all sort of makes sense really so what do i think of them well i think the original one the classic amiga is something i wouldn't necessarily recommend because it's old technology, to be perfectly honest. Whereas for the extra four pounds, you get the sort of flexibility that goes um, with this one. And um, albeit the outputs are the same, I think the, it's the, the fact about that current draw is, uh, is an important factor, really, that the thing draws uh, three times the amount of current that this one does. But I like this. Um, it's a decent one. And if you're a DCC modeler who doesn't need to change their point with a digital address, then this would do you just fine. It is, um, it's a decent piece of kit, but of course it's not expandable, so the Rex wouldn't necessarily work with this. Um, and if you're in the top of the range sort of stuff, then that makes sort of perfect sense really, doesn't it? Um, I've read through all the literature, and then there's one thing that made me smile. I don't imagine they're gonna thank me much for this, but there we are, that's the truth of it. Um, Bear with me, why can't I find it when I want it? Please plan to open up each uh, Cobalt IP digital every five years in order to apply a light coat of good quality oil to the bearings, gears and motor. This maintenance is easier to do and will keep your Cobalt IP digital running forever. And it mentions that on all three points that you, not, you ought to take them apart every five years and oil them and put them back together. Yeah, I should, Coco to try to get underneath this layout and take those apart every five years is some is a step too far for me. I would just, they've got a lifetime guarantee, I would just keep running them. 
um, if you've got an exhibition layout that you can easily get to or a much smaller layout with just a half a dozen points then that's quite straightforward but for me with a layout of 50 points I wouldn't contemplate in having a five-year routine of taking them all apart oiling them and putting them back together because you certainly won't I don't believe you could do it in situ so um, apart from that comment I think they are a, a decent purchase with the warmth of a lifetime guarantee that's the thing that sort of floats my boat so there we go what I reckon yeah I think they're a sound investment as long as they the longevity uh, is is there it is a decent piece of kit they are tested uh, thoroughly so yeah why not give them a go so there we go really that wraps this one up and in a couple of weeks time I'll be back with something else and it should be the layout build because I, and obviously down there you can't see what's going on but the layout fiddle yard progression has gone very well now so um, uh, we can look forward to that in the meantime of course I'd like to thank the people who uh, support the channel that's with the patrons and if you'd like to be on there's the button and if you're not a subscriber then please press that button because it's free and don't forget to give me a thumbs up if you found it enjoyable in the meantime there's a video here and here and I'll see you in two weeks time thanks a lot take care bye bye